Hello, welcome back to the Parkinson's Mouse tutorial. In the last lecture section, we learned about even sampling, and we should take a look at the application of those techniques on this tutorial data set that we've been working with. So the first thing that I want to do is look at some results that we had actually already generated earlier in the tutorial, right after the denoising step. So if you don't already have the workshop server index open to your user account, please do so now. Open that up. You can use your uh, PDF sheet and click on the link there. Um, and then uh, just make sure that you've refreshed the page so that you have the latest data. So I just clicked on this, uh, this icon up here that says reload this page. The first thing I just want to point out is that the uh, files listed here in my version of this page might look different than what you have in front of you. Um, this is okay. This is because I haven't been following along with every single step of the tutorial so far. Um, so we, we generated a table summary before, um, but we never actually got a chance to look at it. So let's open that up now. The file that I want to look for is called data2 underscore table dot qzv. And I want to find that in the list, right click on it, copy link address, and then open up a tab with chime2 view in it. The URL is view.chime2 qiime2 dot org. And once that page is open, there's this gray box here, and just underneath it is a link file from the web. I want you to click on that. And then this text box opens up, and I can click into that and paste the content of my clipboard. And so we should see data2 underscore table.qzv here, and then click on the go button. Now, once this loads, you should see something pretty similar to mine. Um, the numbers that you see on the screen might be slightly different if you picked slightly different trim and truncation values than we did. Um, if that's the case, that's fine. That's uh, totally acceptable. But um, just know that you might see slightly different numbers in that case. So this is a summary of the feature table generated by Data2. So the very first thing that is, is interesting to look at here is the table summary. Um, and that is this three line table here. The very first row is number of samples and next to it we see the uh, uh, value 48. This number should sound familiar to you. We imported 48 samples in our initial importing step and we had 48 samples in our sample metadata. The next row is the number of features, and the number listed here is 287. Feature is just a generic term for the things that are stored within this table. Um, we use the term feature because it can be used interchangeably, or it can be used to represent, um, more, more specifically, things like amplicon sequence variants, or OTUs, or things like uh, metabolites. Um, and so what this is saying is that we have 287 unique ASV features within this table. And then the last row here is the total frequency, which is just under 200,000. So this is telling us that those 287 unique features are observed almost 200,000 times across our 48 samples. Now, there's a few other graphs and, and tables below this. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically they just have to do with frequency distributions across the two different axes of the table. In the lecture that we just watched on uh, even sampling, we saw that one axis of a feature table is the samples, and then the other axis of the feature table is the features. And so that's all that we're looking at here, the counts across those two different axes. The thing that I really want us to focus on is the interactive sample detail. That's this tab up here near the top of the visualization in the middle. Once you've found it, I want you to move your mouse over it and click. Once it loads, you should see a page that looks similar to this. There's a plot in the um, middle of the page. On the right is plot controls and then a table underneath it. What we're looking at here is a summary of 
how many individual samples are present in each of our metadata groups for a given metadata category. So if I look over here, I see the selected metadata category is barcode. And then over here on the x-axis, I see these individual barcodes listed out. Now in the demultiplexing lecture, um, we learned that um, we use barcodes um, to uniquely identify our samples. Um, and so it stands to reason that we would have exactly one sample per barcode um, within our, our metadata groups. And that's exactly what we see here. Each one of these bars has one sample in it. It's not particularly interesting, so I'm going to move over to the metadata category drop down. Um, I just want to first point out uh, this: the list of the categories in here should look familiar. These are the metadata categories that we provided to Chime 2 um, that are specific to our Parkinson's mouse study. This is just to sort of underscore the importance of having robust metadata that appropriately describes your uh, study. Chime 2 doesn't provide the genotype or the donor. It doesn't know anything about that. Okay, so barcode is not particularly interesting, but maybe donor status is. Um, so I want you to look for that in the drop down list, and once you've found it, click on it. After it reloads, you should see far fewer bars. Originally, we had 48 bars in the, the plot, there was one bar per sample, and now we just see two. And apparently both of these uh, bars have 24 samples in them uh, by reading this y-axis or by hovering over. And then the actual categories themselves of these two bars are healthy and PD. Those correspond with those donor statuses that we learned about in the uh, study design phase of the, the tutorial lecture here. Um, we had some of our mice were um, given... Um, fecal transplants from human donors that either had Parkinson's disease or were healthy. And so that's what we're looking at here is how many of the individual samples um, fall into each of those groups. And that's pretty nice to see. We can see some other things in here too, like the cage or the mouse ID or the days post-transplant. Um, but I want to click on donor status. So let's just make sure that we've selected in on that. Now, the last part of this visualization that's pretty interesting is the table underneath. These are the individual samples that are in our feature table. And then in the, the second column here is the feature count. This is the total number of features in each of those samples. Not unique features, but total number of observed features or feature observations. And this is sorted in decreasing order. So the sample that had the most total features uh, in it was this first sample with almost 5,000. And then if I scroll all the way to the bottom of the table, you should see the one with the lowest amount is 347. Now, we discussed uh, the necessity of uh, selecting an even sampling depth um, as, as a mechanism for controlling for the nature of the uneven sampling um, inherent in the sequencing product. Um, and so what we're going to do is work uh, through this interactive visualization to try and identify an appropriate sampling depth. We can do that by clicking on this slider bar underneath the text sampling depth. This might look slightly different on your computer, but um, click on this ball and start to drag it back and forth. You'll notice as you drag that the number here changes. And also, if you drag it far enough, you'll start to see the plot changes. We start to get these blue bars are a little bit shorter, and then there's some gray that starts to appear there. So if I scroll back and forth, I can kind of see these go up and down. And if I scroll all the way to the right, I see that actually my table is all red, with the exception of one of these samples. So what's going on here? Well, the thing that we learned in the last lecture is that um, in order to uh, perform an even sampling uh, operation on a feature table, the first thing we do is filter out any of the samples that are lower than the sampling depth or that have a feature count lower than the sampling depth. So here I have selected 4,917. And so any one of the samples that has fewer features 
in it, then 4,917 are immediately filtered out. This makes sense, right? Because you can't uh, randomly subsample from something that has a fewer total features in it than, than what the sampling depth you've, you've picked is. So a question that we often get is, okay, help me pick uh, an even sampling depth. What, what criteria should I use? What, what should I be considering here? And um, unfortunately, there isn't an easy answer to this. I would say um, the process of selecting a sampling depth depends. Depends on your needs, your study's needs, and the study design as well. What it is that you're um, attempting to test. Um, what, what conclusions are you hoping to draw from, from these data? Um, there are trade-offs either direction. You can select a sampling depth that preserves um, most or all of your samples, but at that low of a depth, you'll see that it actually filters out most of the features. You see here, we, we only have about 9% of the features remaining uh, down, down at this sampling depth, um, but it does keep most of the samples in the table. Similarly, if I scroll all the way over here to the right and drag this up near uh, around 4,800 or 4,900, we see that we retain um, some, some features, but then we drop most of our samples. Um, this, is, uh, this is where the trade-off kind of comes in. Before we talk about selecting an appropriate depth for our study, I do want to just point out one thing, and I don't want to discuss it yet, but I want you to start thinking about it. If I start out with the sampling depth all the way over here on the left, and I slowly drag to the right, as I'm dragging, you'll notice the retained features appears to be increasing. We're up to 26, 30, 40%, and so on. Now, if I continue scrolling, we see it's still increasing. And then at a certain point, it appears to stabilize right around 70%. And then if I continue scrolling to the right, it starts to go back down again. Now, I want you to think about why that is, and we'll discuss as a group later. Now, for me, with this Parkinson's mouse, study, I think it's important for us to retain more samples. Um, in particular here, we have um, uh, not many uh, samples overall because we're already working with a, um, a subset of the, the full data set. Um, so I'm going to just pick here the number 2000. And I'm going to type that in. So I clicked into this box and then typed 2000. And I see here that I have retained all of my healthy samples and all but one of the Parkinson's disease uh, samples, which is, uh, is nice. Um, that's pretty convenient. Now, if I scroll all the way down to the bottom of my table, I will see that I have lost one sample, the sample that had 347 total features in it. It seems pretty reasonable to me. This 347 is a whole order of magnitude lower than the next highest sample. So this seems like a really natural breaking point here um, for us to strip off this, this last sample. So with that, I want to move on to another uh, tool and another set of diagnostic plots that we can use to help corroborate this selection of this even sampling depth. All right, so to finish up our discussion on rarefaction, uh, I would like to explore another aspect to the even sampling question. And this is through the lens of diversity metrics. Um, and so we're going to look at a particular visualization in Chime 2 that focuses on illustrating the impact of rarefaction depth on various alpha diversity measures. Now, I recognize that we haven't yet talked about diversity metrics, alpha or beta, uh, but I think through the lens of rarefaction, we should still be able to find something pretty useful to get out of this, this exercise. So 
let's pull up the Parkinson's mouse tutorial, if we haven't already, and scroll down to the section called Alpha, Rarefaction, and Selecting a Rarefaction Depth. This is right below the phylogenetic tree commands. Once you're there, there is a set of commands, uh, or one command actually, down at the bottom, and I would like to click on the clipboard button in the upper right corner, and then once I've clicked on that, I want to navigate over to the tab in my browser that has my secure shell client open in it. Now, uh, if you don't have this open, uh, take, a, take a brief moment to follow the instructions on your, uh, your hint card, the PDF that we gave out to you. Um, but this is, uh, briefly, it's navigating to Chrome, colon, slash, slash, apps, and then entering your username and password and logging in. Um, then we need to navigate to whatever uh, the appropriate working directory is for our uh, tutorial data set. I'm working in uh, the workshop directory. You might be working in a different directory like PD mice. Um, it doesn't matter where you're, you're working at just as long as you make sure you've navigated back to that location using the CD command, CD space, and then the name of the, the directory. If you're having issues, let us know in Slack and we can try and help you out. Now, I am going to paste that command on my Mac, that is command V. It might be slightly different on your computer. And I'm going to press the enter or return key on my keyboard um, because this takes a few minutes to run. So while it's running, we can start to talk about the meaning of this, this command. So this is the alpha rarefaction visualization in the Q2 diversity plugin. It is a pretty simple command. It only takes two, two inputs. One is our feature table. This is the same feature table that we were just looking at the summary for. And then it takes a sample metadata file. This is the same sample metadata that we've been looking at. Um, and then it produces an output visualization, QZV and takes two parameters, the minimum sampling depth and the maximum sampling depth. The values that we've picked here are 10 and 4,250. These values should sound familiar to you. Um, don't, you don't need to navigate over to this with me, but I just wanna show you. In our sample, uh, interactive sample detail in the feature table summary, we saw that the uh, sample with the least number of recorded features was 347, and then the sample that had the most recorded features was almost 5,000. And so those numbers are what we have have used here, or numbers close enough um, to those that that kind of represented a range of appropriate rarefaction depths in which we would want to. Uh, look at more closely. Now the thing about this this command is what it does is it will start at the minimum depth and it will rarefy the feature table that we've provided to that depth and then it will compute some alpha diversity metrics. Then it will rarefy the table to that depth again and compute those metrics and again and again and again. It does it 10 times at a sampling depth. Then it moves up to another sampling depth in between this minimum and maximum range and computes a rarefied table 10 times and calculates diversity metrics 10 times. It does this over and over and over again. There are a number of steps. I think there's nine or 10 steps in the visualization. Um, what this does is it lets us plot those different diversity metrics at different rarefaction depths. So hopefully by now everyone should see this saved visualization to alpha rarefaction curves.qzv and we should open this and look at it. So I already have a browser tab open here with my workshop index. Um, your username will be different uh, and I just need to refresh my page. Now as I mentioned uh, earlier in this video the files that you see listed here might be slightly different than the files that I have. That's okay. The one that we're looking for is called alpha 
underscore rarefaction underscore curves dot qzv. I am going to right click on it and copy link address. Then I'm going to open a new browser tab at Chime2 View. I already had this one open, but the URL is view.chime2.org. Below the gray box, I'm going to click on File from the Web. Then within the box that that opens, I'm going to Paste. I just double check here. It is Alpha Rarefaction Curves. That's the right file. And then I will click the Go button and let that load. Now, what we have here is, a, in many ways, a visualization similar to the interactive sample detail uh, tab from the, the feature table summary, but it's a, it's a little bit different. What we're looking at is various alpha diversity metrics computed across a range of sequencing depths, and then we are able to group those samples, the different uh, samples alpha diversity values, into different metadata groupings. So up here at the, the top, we have some controls for modifying and manipulating this, this visualization. Uh, on the left, we have the metric. These are two different alpha diversity metrics. It doesn't matter so much which one, um, which one we work with right now. And I recognize that we haven't really talked about alpha diversity yet. Um, so let's start with observed features. So if it's not selected for you right now, click it and make sure that it's selected. Now observed features is a pretty simple uh, alpha diversity metric. Um, I'll give you an example. If I were to try and count the different kinds of animals on a farm, um, maybe I would go to one farm and see that they had a cow and a chicken. The observed species or observed features at that, that farm would be the number two. There would be two different observed features. It um, doesn't matter how many cows or how many chickens, we just we observed two different types of farm animals. If I go to another farm and they have a, a cow and a goat, that would also be two observed features at that farm. They're different, but the overall um, number of those observed farm animals or types of farm animals is two. If I went to a third farm, I would uh, maybe see a cow, a chicken, and a goat, and there the number of observed features would be three. So that should be enough of a preview of how we can think about alpha diversity here. Um, so we'll, we'll use kind of a, a measure of, of the uh, richness here. So um, the other column, or the other drop down here, excuse me, the other control is the sample metadata column. And these are, again, those same metadata columns that we've been looking at before. So let's click on donor status. Again, we had the healthy donor and the Parkinson's disease donor. Now when I click on that, it changes the plot here, and now we see two different curves, a dark blue and a light blue one. They correspond with healthy and Parkinson's disease donors, respectively. What we can see here is a curve that sharply increases towards the left end of the plot and then kind of levels out a bit. And what we're looking at is on the y-axis, this is the alpha diversity metric that we computed. In this case, we selected observed features. And if we come over to the legend, we can click these different uh, symbols in the legend to turn on and off individual lines or to turn on and off the box plots at each of these rarefaction depths. Now, I mentioned when we were running the command that the rarefaction is performed at a number of steps across the the range of the minimum to maximum sequencing depth. So we can see here we had the at uh, depth 10, and then the next depth, and the next depth, and they're evenly spaced out in here. The box plot represents a distribution of the uh, whatever the selected alpha diversity metric is at that particular sequencing depth. 
there's a distribution because there are multiple samples within, within this group. If you recall, we had about 24 healthy samples and 24 Parkinson's disease samples. Um, so that's why there's a distribution there. There's multiple samples making up the, the different observed features uh, at each of these steps. Now, there's another plot underneath here that has the same x-axis, but it has a uh, different y-axis. This is giving us the number of samples. And this should, should actually look like pretty familiar data. This is very much what we were just looking at in the uh, feature table summary, where if we slid the slider back and forth, we would see samples drop out of the um, out of our table. And so we can see a, a similar trend here, where as we increase the sequencing depth, we lose more and more samples from these two groups. And if you recall, we had seen earlier that at that sampling depth of about 2,000, we had all of the healthy samples and we lost one Parkinson's disease sample. And so we see that same signal coming through here. Now, coming back up to this plot up above, I want to talk about the characteristics of this curve because generally speaking, this is uh, a pretty representative uh, characteristic alpha rarefaction curve. And there's, there's some things worth talking about here. First off, at very low sequencing depths, we see the alpha diversity for both observed features or Shannon for that matter, are both quite low by comparison to the higher sequencing depths where we have this kind of sharp increase and then it sort of levels off or maybe gradually increases. This is, is pretty characteristic and I think that it makes makes some sense when we think about the actual process of rarefaction. If we take our 48 samples and rarefy them all down to only 10 features per sample, we are getting rid of so much data. And so back to that observed features idea, like of course we're going to lose unique or rare um, features that might be present in the table. And even things that aren't rare, they're just not the most common features. So what this plot can help us sort of figure out is the stability of the diversity metrics at various sequencing depths. It seems a little bit intuitive to me here, but I, I just want to point out that if we select a sampling depth that is too low, we will artificially impact our alpha diversity value here. So if I selected 100 as the sequencing depth, we see here that the measured diversity at that, that level is significantly different from all the rest of these sequencing depths. And so that's, that's a pretty important thing. We want to make sure that this sort of necessary evil, as Heather talked about, um, we want to make sure that we're not completely manipulating the signal of the alpha diversity by selecting an inappropriate sequencing depth. Now, here we can see that for this donor status and the observed features, we see that in general, across the entire line, with the exception of the last point, Parkinson's disease appears to be slightly lower in observed features than the healthy. So at the very end though, we see a little bit of a flip. So similarly, just like we wouldn't want to select a sampling depth down here, we probably would not want to select a sampling depth all the way up here either, because this completely inverts the, the signal of the data. And this makes sense for similar reasons to why we wouldn't select a low sampling depth. Up here, we've dropped out so many of our samples that we just don't have a representative sampling of the entire data set anymore. So we had talked about 2000, and looking at this plot here, it looks like we're kind of in this, this plateau or this sweet spot where the signal isn't really changing too drastically. And if I click through to, say, genotype, we see a similar type of story here. The plot is more or less stabilized, and we're not losing too many features in, or too many samples in here. 
Similarly, the Shannon diversity is also very stable. Um, and so I'm feeling pretty confident that the uh, sampling depth or sequencing depth of 2000 is going to be pretty appropriate for us to pick here. So one last thing that I wanted to mention is the these um, uh, box plots over here. So I've selected Shannon and Genotype, and I'm just going to come over here real quick and turn off everything but the susceptible box plots. And just really emphasize here that at, uh, at these various sequencing depths, we have different spreads of the computed alpha diversity values. If you were curious about what those box plots represent, you could click on the help button and learn that they represent the distribution of that alpha diversity metric in the, that group of samples, and that it's the 9th and 91st percentiles at the upper and lower whiskers, 25th and 75th percentiles at the lower and upper extents of the box, and that the bar in the middle is the median of the distribution. So with that, I think it is time for us to move on to actually computing the alpha diversity uh, and beta diversity metrics for our data set. And so we will start to cover some of that theory next and then move on in the tutorial data set. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.